Uh, pleasure to welcome you to this uh, public event, a special public event that uh, uh, adds the, uh, also the happy occasion of our board of trustees meeting and of course particular warm welcome to our trustees at this event. Uh, we are grateful to uh, acknowledge the support for this which is provided by the Schwab Charitable Fund and made possible by the generosity of Eric and Wendy Schmidt. Of course Eric Schmidt, one of our uh, much appreciated trustees. As you know, uh, tonight's uh, event will focus on the work of one of the earliest and dearest members of the Institute for Advanced Study, Emmy Neuter, who was a visitor here from 1933 to 1935. These kind of fascinating, crucial beginning years. Um, if you haven't done so, uh, please, I hope you will have then uh, after lecture look at the wonderful display in the lobby which uh, features many kind of, I find quite touching, uh, materials from the uh, Shelby White and Leon Levy Archive Center from uh, Emmy Noter's time. And I'm grateful also, I mean, uh, Shelby White is here in the audience to thank her for her continued uh, support for the wonderful uh, archival material that the Institute has that only kind of increases in value and in importance over the years. Also, you see the uh, Emmy Noether plaquette created by uh, our artist, uh, Stephanie Martiak, who is here tonight. Uh, and uh, she created this for the International Mathematical Union. And you can see the original pencil sketch, the clay rendering, the silicon mold, and also the finished bronze plaquette. As I said, tonight, uh, speakers will uh, uh, f shed various kind of perspectives on the life and work of Emmy Noether, which is kind of an amazing figure because I think the three elements that will be uh, um, highlighted are resonating so strongly I think across the Institute. It's hard to think of a person who is like equally celebrated both in mathematics, in physics and I would say kind of just in the history of intellectual development and all these elements will come together. Uh, after her death in 1935, very unfortunate, Albert Einstein eulogized her in a letter to the New York Times. It's a beautiful letter. I wish I could read it in its entirely, but one sentence is, in the judgment of the most competent living mathematicians, Fräulein Noether was the most significant creative mathematical genius this far produced since the higher education of women began. And I think it uh, was not an overstatement. So I'm very honored that we have uh, four marvelous speakers, all four with a very strong and long and deep connection to the Institute. Uh, Georgia Bankhart uh, is in the School of Mathematics and uh, was a visitor, uh, sorry, member in the, in the School of Mathematics and is a professor emerita at the University of Wisconsin Madison. National Medal of Science laureate Karen Uhlenbeck, visitor in the School of Mathematics and professor emerita in the University of Texas and, and so helpful in so many elements here in the mathematics program at the Institute. And additionally, we hear from Catherine Chung, visitor in the program in interdisciplinary studies an assistant professor at the Delphi University and also uh, a previous director's visitor. But the master of ceremony, and I think kind of the force bringing all of this together, is uh, Ingrid de Bouchy. Uh, she, you were a member in 99 in the School of Mathematics. Uh, you're of course so well known here in the Princeton mathematics community, but at present you're the James B. Duke Professor of Mathematics and Professor of Electrical and Computing Engineering at Duke University. Uh, it's hard to list all your epithets and medals and prizes, uh, perhaps very important that you know, uh, Ingrid was the first women president of the International Mathematical Union, 2011 to 2014. That's also the union that organizes the International Congress of Mathematicians and hands out the Fields Medal. Um, she's a uh, wide range of mathematics, but she be really became world famous for her work on wavelets. She has so many prizes that, in fact, some, pr some prizes you have to run two, two times or three times. So the Leroy Steele Prize you won three times and the Sattler Prize two times, to just give an indication. Um, a Math Harker, a Guggenheim Fellow, and a member of almost all prestigious uh, uh, societies and mathematical institutions. So uh, uniquely positioned, I think, to shed a light on a uh, great and dear uh, Institute member, uh, Emmy Neuter. So I would now like to give the word to Inka Dubushi. Well, uh, thank you all so much for coming so numerous on a rainy and gray day uh, uh, and uh, to, to for this celebration of Emmy Neuter. 
uh, well, you heard already a lot about her and you hear much more. So let me be very brief. But uh, uh, this program uh, is a celebration of Amy Noether. The occasion to have it was that uh, in while I was president of the International Mathematical Union, uh, we, uh, in order to honor the uh, Amy Noether lectures at the International Congress of Mathematics, uh, a, a plaquette was designed to commemorate it and to give to the Emmy Noether Lecture. And it's very fitting that uh, one of our speakers today, the first speaker this afternoon, will be uh, Georgia Bankert, who was the Emmy Noether Lecturer at the last ICM that was held in 2014 in uh, uh, South Korea and Seoul. Um, the second speaker we have uh, will be uh, Karen Uhlenbeck, who uh, both Karen and Georgia have many more awards than I can list here, and I want to not steal their time and let them speak. Uh, but Karen has, uh, on top of the many distinctions she has, uh, she was only the second woman to ever give a plenary lecture at an ICM. The very first one in 1932 was Emmy Noether herself. So, uh, and then after that, we'll hear Cathy Chung, who will tell us a bit about the life. And then I will conclude uh, this afternoon's program with telling you a little bit and give, showing you some slides about the uh, plaquette and uh, about Stephanie Magziak's work. Uh, and then finally, after that, we'll have a reception. So that's the overview of what we're going to do in the next 45 minutes. And uh, I'd like to call on Georgia to come and give us the first presentation. Please welcome her. I spent um, a semester here at the Institute in 1996, and I just don't remember it raining. <laughs> <laughs> so I must have been very happy. Emmy Noether. Noether. Pronounced in German, Noether or perhaps frivolously, not her. <laughs> or maybe more appropriately, no ether, as in breathtaking <laughs> mathematics. Emmy grew up in a mathematical family. Her father was a professor at the University of Erlangen. Uh, she decided very early in life that she wanted to study mathematics. The only problem was they didn't admit women to the university. So she audited classes and passed the entrance exam. And then she, she suddenly became one of two women admitted to the University of Erlangen. And obviously her father had a little bit to do with that. <laughs> So Emmy wrote a, a doctoral thesis in 1907 under Professor Paul Gordon, who was a friend of her father's. And she studied computational invariant theory. She calculated invariance under symmetries. So she looked at expressions like this polynomial. And she said, well, what happens if I interchange x and y? And the answer was nothing. It looked the same. What happens if I change x and minus y? or y and minus x. And again, it's the same. And we can see when we graph this, we plot the points that satisfy that polynomial. So where that polynomial is 0, that's the dark part. Where the polynomial is equal to 2, that's the lighter part. Where the polynomial is equal to 4, that's the really light part. That, this is an eye test, <laughs> if you can see that. But you notice that if you reflect this picture about the dotted line, it stays the same. That's invariance under interchanging x and y. If you switch northeast and southwest, and northwest and southeast, it's the same picture. That's the other invariance. So Emmy studied invariance. Her thesis ended with 331 formulas. She didn't like it. It was a jungle of formulas, routine calculation. She said terrible things about her thesis. 
she stayed in Erlangen. She, um, her father uh, suffered from polio as a young, uh, a teenager, and she often taught his classes. And she became much more involved with trying to do conceptual mathematics, not these computations. And you look at the evolution of her papers, you can just see this. The computations are disappearing. In 1915, Emmy was invited to Göttingen by two of the leading mathematicians at that time, David Hilbert and Felix Klein. Einstein's paper on general relativity, relativity had just come out, and they wanted to really understand the mathematics behind it. Noether's theorem. To every invariance or symmetry property of the laws of nature, there corresponds a conservation law and vice versa. You see a symmetry in the laws, there's something conserved. It might be electrical charge, it might be energy, it might be momentum. You have a pendulum. I'm not trying to put you to sleep. <laughs> it's the same after going one cycle. That means something is conserved. So in Karen Uhlenbeck's lecture, she'll tell you what. And she'll talk about this really incredible theorem. So in 10 years, she had gone from this computational jungle to one of the basic laws of nature. Really remarkable journey. Well, she didn't stop there. She then tackled abstract algebra. So in, in the introduction to Emmy Noether collected works, Nathan Jacobson said, Emmy Noether was one of the most influential mathematicians of this century. The development of abstract algebra, which is one of the most distinctive innovations of 20th century mathematics, is due largely to her in published papers, in lectures, and in personal influ influence on her contemporaries. By now, her contributions have become so thoroughly absorbed into our mathematical culture that only rarely are they officially attributed to her. Emmy was very generous in giving away her ideas, her results. And they were so fundamental that they became kind of woven into the fabric of mathematics. They became part of the furniture. Emmy, on becoming part of the mathematical furniture, commented, my algebraic way methods are really methods of working and thinking. This is why they've crept in everywhere anonymously. So let me just try to explain a little bit about what she did. She was very motivated by number theory. So she looked at the whole numbers, the integers, and this is what's called a ring. It has an addition, it has a subtraction, it has a multiplication. And they satisfy the properties that we learned in elementary school. The multiples of 12 form what mathematicians call an ideal. It has the same addition, the same subtraction, and you can multiply by any integer and you still get a multiple of 12. It's an ideal, or it's ideal, <laughs> okay. And there are lots of ideals. And because 12 factors is three times four, the multiples of four contain the multiples of 12. And there's a sort of containments, this whole ladder. And the same thing is going on with polynomials. So Emmy said, well, what is common to this? What do I see this common? And the one thing she noticed is that if you, no matter where you start, you can only climb finitely many rungs of the ladder. Then it stops. That was going to be the essential property. So in a very 
famous paper of Emmy Noether in 1921, this condition appeared. If every ascending chain of ideals of a ring stabilizes, well, she didn't say this, but we do now, then the ring is said to be Notharian. This is one of the ultimate honors in mathematics, to become an adjective <laughs> and a lowercase adjective. Okay, because it means this is so prevalent and so pervasive. Then she said, well, what can I, what, what consequences are there of being Notharian? Every ideal is the intersection of primary ones. If you have a multiple of 12, it's a multiple of four and a multiple of three. Not prime numbers, prime powers. For every ideal, there exists a finite set of generators. You can build it with just finitely many things and doing multiplication and addition. Her thesis advisor, when he heard this about <laughs> polynomials, said, that's not mathematics, that's theology. There exists. Later on, he warmed to the idea. I've convinced myself that even theology has its merits. R has a descending chain condition on prime ideals. So even though ideals are going this way and stabilizing, prime ideals are going this way and stabilizing. Okay. So what's a prime? What should a prime ideal be? Well, what's a prime number? Well, it only has what? Divisors, one and itself. But we don't have division, so that's not good. There's a property of prime numbers that what? If a prime number divides a product, it has to divide one or the other factor. Eureka. An ideal is prime if the product is in the ideal, is an element of, that's what that funny sum, symbol means, then either one of the factors or the other is. And a few more properties together with Notharian. Every ideal is the product of primes. Notice what she did in this very general context with very strikingly simple proofs, arguments. She recreated number theory. And of course, prime ideals are really one of the fundamental things because when you take a prime ideal, for example, this one, three variable polynomials, and you set it equal to zero, and you start plotting the points in three space, three dimensional space, you get, whoops, a hummingbird. Okay. Beautiful algebraic surfaces, surfaces that are defined by algebraic equations are very related to these prime ideals that Emmy Noether studied. Starting about 1927, Emmy ventured into non-commutative things. So the product this way is not equal to the product this way. And she introduced this idea of crossed products. This is the, the German for schrank to, to product. It sounds more dramatic in German. Cross product. So take the rational numbers, the fractions, and take the roots of a polynomial. Okay, here's a really simple polynomial, x squared minus 17 equals zero. So that's the square root of 17 and minus the square root of 17. Okay, I think I chose this because this was a number of Republican candidates in the first <laughs> primary. <laughs> okay. And 
look at the permutations that you can permute the roots and leave the rational numbers alone. So you can either leave the roots alone or you can swap them. And she built something out of this, something called the cross product algebra. So the elements have something from F and something labeled by one of these permutations. And then she said, well, the multiplication isn't quite commutative because when I switch A to the other side, I've got to twist it by the permutation. And when I multiply two of these things, I get a fudge factor, something in F. Crazy, crazy definition, but just the right thing. So in a joint paper, a very famous paper with Richard Brower, who spent some time here, Hassa, Emmy Noether, she used cross products to define, to construct all the rings that have division over things that are like this F. Emil Artin, who spent 10 years at Princeton, said this is the greatest advance in number theory over the last years. Where's the number theory? It's buried in there somewhere. And they also realized that this construction could be used to study the topology of shapes. So topology looks at things that you can stretch and you can shrink. You think of everything as being rather, what, elastic, and you stretch it, you shrink it. She said these same things could be used to solve problems in topology. These are two of the leading topologists of the, that time, Alexandrov from Russia, Heinz Hoff from Germany. Throw away your computations. Use these algebraic methods. None so virtuous as the re <laughs> reformed, right? <laughs> Throw away your computations. <laughs> Use algebra. She took this method, message to the International Congress when she was one of 21 mathematicians, the first woman to speak at the International Congress of Mathematicians in 1932. This was her paper. The title is just under her name, Hypercomplex Systems, Algebras in their connections to commutative algebra and number theory. She had a message to give. These non-commutative algebras tell you, can tell you a lot about commutative things and number theory. Nineteen thirty-two was a banner year for Emmy. She not only gave, gave a plenary lecture at the ICM, she won a joint prize with Emil Artin. And then eight months after the International Congress, she was dismissed from her position at the University of Göttingen when the Nazis came from into power. This was her position. Roughly translated, it's associate professor with the privilege to teach. It also should say, and with a very small salary. <laughs> like so many people who left Germany, she came to the US with much help from the, for the Rockefeller Foundation, the Institute for Advanced Study, Bryn Mawr, and took up a position at Bryn Mawr. Tuesday she spent at the Institute. This is where she connected with her friends, Hermann Weil, Albert Einstein from Germany. She was invited in 1935 to give lectures at the Institute, one two-hour lecture every Tuesday. This was for the academic year 1934 to 35. In April of 1935, she announced to her class 
that she was obliged to call a brief recess because she had to undergo surgery. She expected to come back in a few weeks. She died four days after she had her operation from complications of surgery. She left a tremendous legacy. She inspired many. Her mathematics expired, inspired many people. Her physics, but most especially her life. No ether. Breathtaking. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Georgia. Now we, uh, we welcome Karen Uhlenbeck, who's giving us the next presentation, and uh, who, uh, as, as I said earlier, is uh, another uh, very, very prominent mathematician. She was the, uh, uh, the very first woman who spoke again, who had again a preliminary lecture at the International Congress of Mathematicians, and that was in 1980, was it? 1990. So that was almost 60 years later. But here's Karen. Let's welcome her. I always wondered whether it was worse being the first woman or the second woman to talk at the International Congress. <laughs> uh, actually, this is, well, it wasn't supposed to be up there. Anyway, uh, OK, the fame of, uh, of Noethe in physics rests on a, a single theorem that's really a theorem in mathematics. It relates the symmetry uh, of, um, uh, and the fixed quantities left uh, quantities left fixed under motion. And uh, the application uh, in, in uh, physics is universal in all sorts of things. But uh, this, it's actually easy to understand in mechanical systems. And so I'm going to try to illustrate as a little comic relief for the, uh, the series. OK, so uh, the first thing, uh, I have that, I'm not supposed to have that up there, but now that I have that up there, I guess I'll explain what you're going to see. So uh, when, uh, that's, that's not me throwing the ball because I don't have a skirt on, but uh, uh, <laughs> there we have someone throwing a ball, and you see it's motion. And I will, I will now, uh, uh, what are you supposed to notice about it when I throw the ball? Well. The, the, the first thing to start out with is, is that until I hit hits that further wall and ignoring friction, uh, the, the stage is symmetric. It's the same over there, here, it's the same over here, it's the same over here, the same over here. It's symmetric in the, uh, X, uh, in the left uh, and what right directions and uh, forward and back. And of course, if I was in a bigger place, this would be much more obvious, but they didn't, exp uh, the, the, it's auditorium is that. Now, when I when I throw the ball, uh, it is not the same up and down. Okay, so so it has a symmet symmetry in the plane, but no symmetry up and down. So when I throw the ball, well, that was a little bit not uh, that wasn't supposed to be so that way. Uh, you notice what two things about it. First of all, you notice it went in a straight line. Okay, everybody agreed that it went in a straight line. Also, if you actually check, it actually went at a constant speed in that direction. And though the, the planar symmetry and the constant speed, actually you call it velocity or momentum in physics, but you know, speed is good enough for us. Uh, the, this planar symmetry and the constant speed in direction uh, are related by her theorem. And um, so, uh, Let's go on to the next one. Uh, now, there's another invariance that's present, which you probably also will agree. And that is, is that the laws of physics that govern this ball are the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, uh, 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 five minutes ago, ten min uh, six, uh, six minutes ago. And the, the connection with the conserved quantity is conserved is uh, conservation of energy. Now, conservation of energy is not, yeah, there we go, is not completely obvious to explain, but you will actually agree intuitively. Uh, energy is 
a combination of motion and in the Earth's gravity height. So it's actually, uh, it, it's actu it actually, so you notice when you have a, the ball is high, it's going to be slow. And when it's coming down here, it comes down low and fast. And the relation between the speed and the height is conservation of energy. And so, I'll illustrate that. You see it going slow. I, unfortunately, the, the tennis balls bounce more than I realized they would. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, it was supposed to go, it was supposed to go up the same height uh, uh, before. Okay, so now we come to the, the, the next law of, of, and that is spherical symmetry. Now, I can't illustrate spherical symmetry, but most of you would agree that out in outer space, things are the same in every direction. You agree? I mean, you know, there's no, there's no, when you're way out in space, there's no, there's no difference in the way, way, way you look. So the result of this is something called conservation of, of, it's called angular momentum, which is really the hardest thing for any physics students and especially for math students to understand. But anyway, it's the angular momentum. And the first result of conservation of an angular momentum is, is that an object un, uh, uh, or orbiting the sun orbits in a plane. And that's related to the fact that this, when you look at all directions, of course, it's not the, the motion is not symmetric, but the symmetry of the laws of physics is related to the planar. Now, uh, I haven't done the hardest part of that, though, because we can all understand what, uh, what uh, symmetry uh, in a plane, uh, that, that the resulting in the plane would be, but I didn't, <laughs> I left out the circular symmetry, and then if I go on to my next, whoops, go on to my, my oh, and, but, I ha, but I also have objects that are, that are invariant under rotations. So uh, the, the actual orbit of the, the Earth around the sun or something, again, the laws are invariant under the, that circle, and I haven't told you that law, but here I have another example of an object that actually has circular symmetry. That is, the laws of physics are the same in all directions in this, in this circle. And so the result is conservation of angular momentum. Now, this is really hard to understand, but I could do a couple motions to explain what it means. For example, if I just swing the thing back and forth, notice it just swings back and forth and uh, stays in uh, uh, one line. Well, that means its angular momentum is zero, and its angular momentum stays zero. And of course, I can give it another motion. And here we have some angular momentum that's varying, and I don't know if you can see it, but uh, uh, what it means uh, when it's on the outer part of its motion, uh, on the outer circle, it's moving slower, and when it's coming round nearer the or origin, it's moving faster. And the, so you can quantify that in, in, in uh, angular momentum. So, uh, so you see, her law is considered uh, very fundamental, and of course, those laws were known before Newton, but they get her name, so, uh, in physics. So, uh, how did her work come about? This is very interesting, and I, I really only learned it uh, recently, so uh, I, have, I have a little there. Uh, I, I should say that uh, phys uh, physicists and mathematicians had a pretty good idea of some things about uh, conservation laws. Uh, they, they knew that uh, systems, uh, uh, they, which called field theory, that were invariant under time and space, should have conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. Remember, momentum is a fancy name for speed. So, and and so you have you should have conservation of energy. And special relativity didn't confuse that. In fact, the way the laws are expressed, the, the, they're automatically invariant under the 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 law uh, the the symmetries of of special relativity. So special relativity wasn't a problem. But Einstein's uh, Theory of relativity was announced in 1915. Well, 1915. So I'm actually here on my here on my, um, and I have not been able to get a date. But Hilbert now Hilbert was is one of the 
probably most famous mathematicians of all time. He po uh, what he's really, he's known for a tremendous amount of, of things, but what he's be best known for is his problems. And some of his problems in mathematics are still on the million dollar prize list. So he, he's, we he's very famous for his problems. But one of the things he did is he gave what's called a variational formulation to general relativity. And, and uh, so uh, he, he, he wrote down, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a minimization technique. And so he said that, well, you write down this expression, and if you actually find the places where it's level, uh, that th those will be the solutions to Einstein's equations. And this was very, this was uh, all very well, but, um, uh, the Einstein's equation also have a tremendous amount of symmetry. They have as much symmetry as anybody could imagine. I mean, there, there's no, you're out in outer space, you don't have any coordinates, you don't have any, uh, any, any uh, way of telling where you are, and, and, uh, so, and, so the, and they're in empty space. So, uh, 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 <coughs> but in particular, they have time and space invariant. I mean, there's no difference which way you're looking when you actually write down something like Einstein's equations. And uh, uh, so uh, Hilbert was actually puzzled by the lack of conservation of energy and momentum. And remember, momentum is speed, but momentum is the right word. Uh, and uh, uh, Noether had uh, actually moved to Göttingen uh, in 19, that's not right. She'd moved to er, er, Göttingen earlier than that. I don't, I don't, I don't have the, uh, the right date. She'd moved, oh, 1907, I have. Well, that's the doctorate. I don't know what I got wrong. Anyway, uh, and, uh, but Einstein's relativity was uh, announced in 1915, and Hilbert's variational formalism was very soon after, and Hilbert was, had this puzzle, and he gave this problem to Emmy Noether. Why were there no, uh, no uh, conservation of energy and conservation of momentum in general relativity? And uh, she, I, since I, I, don't, I don't have letters or so, but uh, very soon in 1918, she actually wrote a ver the, her definitive paper solving this problem. But in the process, she made, uh, she, she uh, identified symmetries and conservation laws in the completely definitive fashion, which is just held to this day. And so uh, uh, she cites a number of her colleagues. So I mean, some idea of this was in the, in the works, but her theorem laid to rest at least one very complicated system trying to ex unsuccessfully to explain what energy was. Uh, it, <coughs> It, uh, uh, it was a paper, it's a paper in mathematics. So how, how can you have a paper in mathematics that's in physics? Well, it's a paper about a mathematical formula, and the physicists say this mathematical formula applies to space out there. So there is a difference, and she was a pure mathematician. She didn't go out, she, she didn't, didn't do experiments or, or calculate things, uh, physics things. Uh, <coughs> And uh, uh, it, it was very, her paper was very much admired at the time. I mean, it, it's clear, it just laid to rest a whole lot, it, 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 it answered a lot of puzzles, it laid to rest a lot of questions, it also answered the question of why there were no time, why, there, why energy and momentum were not conserved in general relativity. Uh, uh, actually, in mathematics, uh, it's not actually been, that important a, a theorem. That is, most mathematicians don't know Noether's theorem. I, that's embarrassing to say, but it's true. And uh, on the other hand, the symmetries are absolutely fundamental, are one of the fundamental quantities for all the physics that's built, from mechanics to field theory to uh, quantum mechanics. Um, and, and <laughs> where, of course, the quantum numbers relate to groups which are sy symmetries. Uh, and 
in the 60s, Gelman uh, constructed a quantum field theory using current algebras, which extend her ideas about currents. And uh, uh, <coughs> That, that Nerda had. And uh, so working at these current algebras was actually, a, 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 it took many years and actually uh, uh, pe people at the institute took place in this. Uh, and symmetry is a, is a basic uh, concept in the formulation both of quantum field theory and particle physics. And uh, so uh, I, I should point out that the words, if you've ever heard anybody talk about it, things like color, flavor, and charm relate to symmetries in particle physics. Uh, supersymmetry, uh, which involves imaginary fields and relations between imaginary and real fields, postulates supersymmetric partners in the ba basic particles, and it's still possibly a viable theory. So Nota's theorem is taught as a basic part of a quantum field theory course. And I doubt, though, however, uh, uh, Nota would actually recognize the present form. However, the present form is very algebraic, and she would actually like that because she was a very algebraic rather than geometric person. Uh, <coughs> uh, most f physicists do know the name. And as one young physicist said to me, I just thought he was another, some other physicist. <laughs> and uh, that's not a bad legacy for a mathematician. That brings us to the third short presentation uh, this evening by uh, Kathy Chung, uh, who will come up now and uh, talk to us about uh, aspects of the life of Emmy Nutter. Please, let's welcome Kathy. That was wonderful. Um, what drew me first to the story of Emmy Noter was an inconsistency. For my most recent novel, I was interested in learning about the history of women in science and mathematics, and Noter was high on the list of noteworthy people, often described as the most important female mathematician of all time. When I read the tribute Einstein published in the New York Times upon her death, I was struck by the same line Robert quoted from, which I'll read to you again. In the judgment of the most competent living mathematicians, Fräulein Noether was the most significant creative mathematical genius thus far produced since the higher education of women began. This line caught my attention because it went further than the endorsements of Noether that I had read thus far, which often positioned her only in comparison to other women mathematicians, of whom there were very few during her time, and compared her instead to all the mathematical geniuses to have graced the, thir the first 30-some years of the 20th century, which, let it be said, was a particularly heady time for mathematical geniuses. It turned out that this line, however, was almost universally misquoted, including by the New York Times itself. A 2012 article read, Albert Einstein called her the, the most significant and creative female mathematician of all time. More recently, with the help of the archivists here at the Institute, I was startled to discover yet another inconsistency. When we looked at the original German version of the tribute Einstein penned, his words were actually closer in spirit to the misquotes than of the published translation. His original words translate to something along the lines of, Noether's talent was the most significant to have developed in the bosom of a woman. What I find interesting about these inconsistencies is that they seem to proliferate around the legacy of Emmy Noether and to stem from a kind of anxiety of categorization as if we need to divide mathematics into the men's version and the women's version, as if it were a sport like golf. But Emmy Noether didn't work at mathematics in isolation or for the women's team. Her colleagues, her teachers, and her students were mostly men. And what I wanted to know was where did Emmy Noether stand among them and the greater category of important mathematicians? The first mathematician I approached with this question merely added to my confusion. He said that Noether wasn't truly first-rate at all, did not merit the kind of recognition that her peers who had been invited as faculty to places such as IAS could claim. He claimed she was notable only because of what she'd been able to accomplish as a woman. So now I was left with this additional question. Had she truly earned the recognition she was given? 
further investigation led me to the conclusion that has convincingly been bolstered today, that Emmy Noter was indeed a great mathematician who made far-reaching, important contributions to the fields of mathematics and physics. It also led me deeper into her story, into the things that were said and believed and insisted upon about her, into what she was given and what she was denied, and how she was championed by her friends but also ridiculed by them how she was both admired for her brilliance and pitied for lacking what they called back then the feminine charms. The truth is, not much is known of Emmy Noter other than the work she left behind. We may think of this as fitting, since it was her work that she shaped her life around. Here is the basic outline of what we know, some of which you've already heard from the previous talks. We know that Emmy Noter was born in 1882 in the university town of Erlangen, Germany, where her father, Max Noter, was a well-respected mathematician. Her biographers note that by all reports, she was an unremarkable student growing up, who did not appear exceptional as a child in any way. Given all she accomplished, I would venture to say that this seems to reveal more about the community Noter grew up in and its inability to recognize her aptitude than it reveals anything about Noter's own talent. Her biographers also note that Noter loved to dance, that she spoke French and English, and that she meant to be a teacher, but after passing her teaching examinations in the year 1900, she enrolled as an auditor in mathematics courses at the university. Women at that time, as you've heard, were not allowed to enroll as regular students, but only as auditors if the professor allowed it, and permission was often denied. In the winter semester of 1900, Emmy Noter was one of two women auditors among nearly 1,000 students. She was allowed to take the university examination in July of 1903, after which she spent the following winter at the University of Göttingen, where she was exposed to mathematicians such as Hilbert, Minkowski, and Klein, but she left after one semester when the law changed, and she was allowed to matriculate at the University of Erlangen. She completed her dissertation in 1907, after which she worked for the university, lecturing without pay for the next seven years. Then, in 1915, at the age of 33, Emmy Noter was invited by luminaries Felix Klein and David Hilbert to join the department at the University of Göttingen. This invitation was met with resistance from the faculty and other departments and led to university-wide turmoil. Opponents said that it would be the end of higher education if a woman were allowed to teach there. To add insult to injury, Noter was denied her habilitation, the postdoctoral credential needed in Germany to become a professor because of unmet legal requirements. That unmet requirement was that according to regulations, habilitations could only be granted to male candidates. The compromise eventually reached was that Noter would stay in Göttingen and even be permitted to teach, but for no pay and under David Hilbert's name. In the years immediately following, Noter worked closely with Klein and Hilbert, did much important work of her own, and taught exuberantly, gathering around her a group of students who would come to be known as Noter's boys. And as good-natured as Noter reputedly was in response to the many slights and obstacles she would suffer through her career, she was known as a ferocious advocate for her students, fiercely defending and promoting them, generously giving them time, attention, and ideas, for which they gained increasing renown, and for which she claimed little credit. While many of her students, including van der Waarden, Otto Schilling, and Max During, went on to become professors and acclaimed mathematicians, it is a well-known fact that for everything she did, for all the recognition she was afforded and everyone she helped, Emmy Noter herself never held a permanent position at any institution. She did, however, eventually gain her habilitation in 1919, in the same year that women were given the right to vote in her country. She was given a title in 1922 and was able to secure a small salary from the University of Göttingen starting in 1923. Her colleague, Hermann Weil, who would later become faculty here at the Institute, worked tirelessly to promote her situation, though to little effect, saying he felt embarrassed, occupying a position so far above her, since he considered her a superior mathematician to him in many respects. Indeed, by the time Nazis came to power in 1933, 
Nurture had gained an international reputation and in 1932, as it's been pointed out several times, became the first woman to give a plenary address to the International Congress for Mathematicians. She was the only woman to hold that honor until Karen Uhlenbeck gave her address in 1990. Nevertheless, Nurture was the first faculty member in her department to be dismissed by the Nazis. And in 1933, she came to America to be a visiting professor at Bryn Mawr for one year. Curiously enough, it was the Institute for Advanced Study, along with the Rockefeller Foundation, that paid for her salary there. Her friends Weil and Veblen had first endeavored to secure a position for her here at the Institute, and when they were unable to do so, had secured the funds from IAS and the Rockefeller Foundation to support her position at Bryn Mawr. One can imagine the sense of significance with which her friends secured a place for her there. The greatest woman mathematician, at a university just for women, finally in a place where she belonged. But her position there, as always, was precarious. The funds were temporary, and in 1935, the Rockefeller Foundation indicated that it would not be renewing its support. Helen Manning, the dean of Bryn Mawr, wrote to Abraham Flexner, then the director of IAS, to inform him of this decision, explaining that Bryn Mawr could not plan to put Noter's salary on a regular budget because, Remarkable as are her gifts, there seems every reason to suppose that Dr. Noter would not be able to handle undergraduate work in mathematics. Even the graduate students find her work hard and her standards of what may be expected from them somewhat high. Our only hope, therefore, would be that some way we might have research professorships at Bryn Mawr for which Ms. Noter would certainly be eligible. And so it turned out that Noter did not fit so perfectly where everyone had thought she would finally belong, and was in fact isolated from the students who could most benefit from her, as well as from her closest colleagues. It is not surprising then that Noter traveled weekly to the institute to visit her friends here, where she also gave seminars in algebra for free. In response to the funding crisis confronting Noter, Veblen, ever in her corner, suggested that the Institute set aside funds to permanently fund her position at Bryn Mawr or elsewhere, insisting, there is no doubt that apart from the uniqueness of her position as a woman mathematician, she is quite obviously one of the most important scientists who have been displaced by the events in Germany. Flexner disagreed, stating, I have a feeling that the Institute has done all that can be done or that can fairly be expected in the field of mathematics for German scholars, far more indeed than any institution has done, and we must be careful not to create the impression that we are overlooking Americans in order to help these unfortunate foreigners. It is worth noting, however, that Flexner, along with the Institute, would continue to extend himself in the admirable work of helping European and German refugees find finding positions in the years to come. Still, Veblen made great efforts on Emmy Noter's behalf, and with the support of other faculty, including Einstein, he was able to secure the funds needed to renew Noter's position for another year, though her salary would be reduced by 25%. That same month, however, on April 14, 1935, Emmy Noter, after undergoing a routine operation, suddenly died. She was 52 years old. Einstein's tribute published in the New York Times on May 1st reads, far-sighted friends of science in this country were fortunately able to make such arrangements at Bryn Mawr College and Princeton that she found in America up to the day of her death not only colleagues who esteemed her friendship, but grateful pupils whose enthusiasm made her last years the happiest and perhaps the most fruitful of her entire career. And here yet another inconsistency arises. The original German version, written by Einstein pre-translation, does not make any claim that her last years were the happiest or most fruitful of her career. Instead, it says, in this country, sensitive friends of science took care that she would be able to work in a circle of friendly colleagues and grateful students up to her death, which caught up with her in the middle of cheerful and productive work. In any case, both versions indicate that Noter was cheerful and productive, and history reports she made meaningful friends and would be a lasting influence on the students she met in the last years of her life. This should come as no surprise, because as difficult and seemingly insurmountable as the obstacles Noter faced were throughout her life, whether it was working without pay or recognition, her dismissal from Göttingen or her exile from Germany, she always faced her challenges with unwavering, stout-hearted good humor and grace. 
As narrow as the path she walked must have been, she prevailed. If there is one lesson I take from Noter's life, it's this. How easily her life and work could have been lost to us. How much depended on others to ensure that it was not. It seems to me that one of the functions of genius is to blast open a door where before there was only a wall, to shine a light where there had only been darkness. It is up to the rest of us to explore what new territory has been illuminated. Likewise, it seems to me that it is up to us to remember the legacy of Emmy Noter and the obstacles she faced. How easy it is to imagine that with some slight shift in circumstance, had her father not supported her, had his colleague at the university been unwilling to take on a woman as his pupil, had none of her peers recognized her early potential, had she not had a small inheritance that sustained her during all her years of working for no pay, how easily Emmy Noter could have remained the unexceptional, unremarkable child that her biographers tell us that she was. Indeed, she instead, instead, she persevered, entered a world that had been reserved for men, and took her place among the great mathematicians of her time. I, for one, am very glad that she did, and very happy to be celebrating her life and her legacy with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Now, the program had foreseen that we would have a short panel uh, discussion with Q&A, but we all were so full in uh, talking about Emmy that everybody took more time than foreseen. Uh, the speakers will be around, however, for, the small, uh, for, for a small time afterwards when, when you, you can admire the artwork of Stephanie Marczak, and I encourage you to have to address your questions to them then. Um, I'd like to conclude with uh, a transition to uh, the artwork by, uh, by Stephanie Magziak. Uh, and I think there is a presentation here which uh, will be brought up soon. Um, so, as I said, uh, so why are we having this event here? I've been asked by several people. Uh, it's, it's not a round anniversary of her birth or her death or, and so on. Well, it's because we uh, made these, these, these plaquettes for the ICM Emmy Noether lectures and uh, they uh, have, are now ready and materials are being shipped or have been shipped to Berlin and I thought it would be nice, given that it's a Princeton artist who realized this wonderful design, to celebrate it here and I'm so happy that the Institute took up my suggestion to do so. So let me give you a little intro to the art before we walk out. So, uh, Emmy Noether. The uh, uh, Lady of the Rings, as you heard. Uh, there are very few pictures that we know of Emmy Noether. I mean, it's just something remarkable. Most mathematicians of her stature, we have many more portraits of. This is the one that was used for the poster for this event. This is another one that I like a lot. This is one uh, that we'll see back again. Uh, and yet another one. This is the one, actually, I was told by um, uh, this and, and some other of her pictures that you can see on the Oberwolfach archive, uh, was one of her favorites, because it showed her actually on a boating trip. I mean, uh, very relaxed, smiling. And uh, so the sketch you see outside was the first sketch that uh, Stephanie Magziak, when we formed this idea of making design for the plaquette, made. And uh, it was inspired, you see the lapels come from this picture. And then the general position was inspired somewhat by this one. But the, uh, the idea of having that hint of a smile uh, came from the fact that we knew that this picture she liked most was one in which she was laughing and, and joyful. And uh, so uh, this, from a sketch, uh, in order to make these, these designs, uh, 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 Stephanie made this, this in clay, this bas-relief. And this is a picture that you don't see outside because this became, this was an early version of the clay model, and this became the finished clay model that you can see outside. And this is still a version where the formulas were not uh, uh, chiseled in. Uh, uh, we wanted these two formulas, and uh, there's a story actually behind those formulas. I mean, one is the w physics paper, for uh, the paper that had this influence in physics, was so influential for Noether's law, and the other has this uh, ascending chain condition. Um, 
the paper, uh, uh, the first paper, the 1918 paper you've heard of, this is its first page. This is the page where that formula appears, and here you see formula 11 is that formula, and uh, we, we copied it from there to actually, I gave the, the template to, to, to Stephanie so that she could sizzle it in. The other formula does not appear in her papers. I mean, this is a formula for which she's so known. And I asked for, I mean, for this formula, I'd asked the mathematical physicist I know to, to find me the best version because it was important to Stephanie that it was not in the LaTeX version that I'd given her, but in the original typography. So I asked uh, 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 the Gross to look in algebra papers to find me the version of her formula in the, in the algebra papers. I wasn't there, he said, I found the idea, he said, but the formula itself. So what we did, I mean, and, and Stephanie agreed, although, was, was with the topography of those papers and with the notations she would have used, fabricate the formula to put it on. on um. uh, so this is the, uh, the finished plaquette. The back of it is gorgeous, it shows the ascending or descending rings, as you want, uh, descending chain. Of, uh, uh, and here are the, uh, I, I'm quoting Stephanie in a description she gave us to uh, introduce this work at the last ICM. Uh, she liked to learn the character of her subject, to learn about what was going on, to see pictures and so on. She discovered how, how, how uh, Amy was so open and sharing of her ideas and with her students and, 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 and uh, uh, fellow mathematicians. Uh, when we search for suitable photographs, it was very hard to find them. And uh, then uh, learning more about her, uh, Stephanie thought, well, she would make an amalgam of, of these different impressions, but it was really important to show how a lively and warm and how Dorsey and cheerful person she was. And uh, she got inspiration from many other artworks in order to, to, to get to the work. But uh, in the end, this is uh, Emmy Noether. I mean, I, I give you Emmy Noether as an uh, division that uh, Stephanie made of her. And you can see her more outside. But I'd like to st uh, uh, Stephanie to stand up now so that you can all recognize her. She's happy to answer questions outside. <laughs>